Uh, welcome to, uh, to our final session of our spirituality series. And I think you're in for an exciting afternoon. So um, I want to make a quick unpaid political announcement as we begin. If you get something from me in your email, if it's, n okay, John just got it. I got fished. Maybe I was desperate. <laughs> okay, so welcome uh, this afternoon. And um, as we begin, and it's good to see you all here, and I hope you'll all be able to stay till the end because it'll get even more exciting as the panelists begin to uh, respond and react with each other and with the audience. So let us begin with prayer as usual, Sister Marilyn. Good afternoon. So as we begin this afternoon, as we usually do, we try to just pause and quietly remember that our God is with us and fills us totally at all times. And so we pray in gratitude to you, our loving God, for knowing us intimately and fulfilling every moment of our lives, wherever we are, with goodness and light. Light. We ask you to bless our presenters, Anne, Jonathan, and Julie, who have come to know you in beautiful and unique ways as they have journeyed through the marketplace of their individual lives. May their sharing enrich us with new insights and a greater commitment to you and to your purpose for each of us. Continue to overwhelm us with your wisdom and grace as you guide our steps on this journey of life. We do ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who lives in unity with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Marilyn. As we begin, uh, I will introduce the speakers, and then before, as one gets finished and the next one takes over, I will just tell you a little bit about how they see um, themselves um, working with the, with the uh, subject that we, that we gave them. So we're going to begin. We'll begin with Ann Hall down at that end. Ann is a professor here at the university, and she is a Dominican associate. She has published widely in the performing arts, in you know, feminism, and the media. There's somebody that's coming, but we don't, <laughs> trying to get in. <laughs> Her most recent publications on the media include examinations of the representations of mothers in popular culture through an edited collection entitled Mommy Angst and the proliferation of pornography in the digital age. She is currently serving as the president of the board of a portable theater, touring, a touring theater company, and is vice president of the Martin DePores board. So that's Anne on that end. And we'll just take them in order here. Uh, Dr. Julie Hart is an associate professor of sociology here at the university, sociology and peace and justice. Uh, Anne is received her MA in International Peace Studies in 1992 and a PhD in Sociology from the University of Notre Dame in 1995. Anne was an associate professor, or Anne Hart, <laughs> and Julie, uh, was a professor of Sociology and Peace Studies at Bethel College in Kansas. Her current research examines dynamics of significant identity change among anti-US, among anti-war US veterans. She volunteers with Christian peacemakers and teams each summer doing human rights works in Israel, Palestine, and currently in Colombia. She enjoys gardening, reading, walking, and biking. <clears throat> she came in here on a bike, just got out of class 10 minutes ago. And last but not least, we have Jonathan Bashirs. And Jonathan is a senior here at Ohio, Ohio Dominican University. And, uh, Jonathan has a very interesting 
um, present and future, we hope, and we're well, sure he does. He's a, <laughs> he is studying accounting and finance. What could be more interesting than that in this day? Jonathan plans to attend law school in 2014 in order to become a tax attorney. And I just remember, and he does this with some humor, and I remember when he was giving a paper of an essay contest that he won, he said that it's probably people don't really believe that there is such a thing as humor in taxes, but he manages to put it there. His interests include the theology of financial stewardship and Christian financial counseling. He has volunteered with Ohio Dominican's Vita, Vita, Vita program, where students provide free tax preparation services to low-income and elderly people in the community. So you can see we've got a wealth of knowledge and experience at this table. So without taking any more of their time, we will begin with Julie. Did you get your breath yet, Julie? I did. Okay, we'll start with Julie, and then they'll take it from there. Would you like to, to give you the microphone? If you can hear me, I'll catch you up Is there anybody who can't? I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> All right, you okay? If it, if it comes to a point where you can't, raise your hand and we will dismantle this thing.
some significant downsides. Millions of us, in order to cope with the news, make it through the day medicated for depression or anxiety or stomach and intestinal ailments or heart problems and high blood pressure. And for just staying awake, we use cup after cup of coffee. We struggle with fear and hurt. We struggle with selfishness and crazy.
There were lots of rays of sunshine even in those clouds, Julie. Thank you very much. And next we're going to hear from, um, from Anne. And Anne, um, well, I, when I read her bio, you know pretty much what she'll be talking about, so. And now for something completely different. <laughs> This, this is the idea. I'm going to talk today about, I admire Julie, but I am not Julie. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk today about social networking and justice. Um, we treat, tweet, friend, and text constantly. Teachers grapple with student focus as the cell phone and iPad replace note passing, spitball throwing, and doodling. Even friends struggle to stay disconnected during face-to-face -face interactions, a problem that prompted a recent trend called cell stacking. What is cell stacking, you ask? Well. During dinner, friends place their cell phones on top of one another in the center of the dining table. First one to look at his or her cell phone pays the bill. So this is serious business. Certainly the technology has its advantages. People connect with friends they have lost contact with. Electronic dictionaries may actually help people expand their vocabularies. And caregivers, like myself, love the constant contact these technologies provide. People, groups, even entire countries that would have been, been unable to gain a, a public attention now have access to a public forum. My own husband and I started up a theater company, a portable theater, that is, a portable theater.com, in case you're wondering. We started it up this summer. <laughs> In six weeks, thanks to electronic and social media, we literally had nothing in mid-May, and by mid-June, we'd had bookings, we had a uh, fundraiser event at the uh, Franklin Park Conservatory, and we would marvel in the middle of our work, thinking, remember when we used to have to lick envelopes to do this? You know, it's, it's amazing. So there's a lot good. But like many technological, scientific, and medical discoveries, there is always a cost, a dark side, to the apparently innocuous social network. The remarkable Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, again, available on the internet for free. I remember in graduate school, you, you have to sell your life to get uh, you know, the, encycl the, the hard copy of the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. This, you just click a button and there it goes. Anyway, they observe that there's an urgent need for attention to this phenomenon because it is reshaping how human beings initiate and or maintain virtually every type of ethically significant social bond or role. We can't ignore this. One case in particular, and close to home, makes it clear that we as liberally educated, ethical intellectuals and Dominicans need to examine social networking seriously. The case, the Steubenville rape trial, illustrates just how complicated and ambivalent social networking is. But before turning to that trial, it's important to look at social networking in general and the scholarly work that has already been done about social networking. The Stanford Encyclopedia again notes that human beings have been socially networked in one manner or another for as long as we've been on the planet. But when philosophers today speak of social networking, they usually refer to a group of information technologies based on or inspired by the Web 2.0 software standards. This development allowed users to build increasingly seamless connections between their online social presence and their existing social networks online. So this is very different. Early thinkers on social networking relied on modern philosophers such as Heidegger to address the online environment, basically arguing that technology prohibited real human interaction. The limits of this argument became clear very quickly. In some situations, social networking fostered human interaction which would not normally occur due to, for example, geographical distance or the homebound and disabled. They now had an option to connect with human beings in a way that they hadn't. 
Other studies highlighted the advantage of the network in terms of diversity. There was an argument that social network users only friended people who were like them and therefore isolated themselves from the real diverse world. Studies noted that while this was true, the social networking world was so large and diverse that it would be difficult to isolate yourself from all opposing viewpoints. And the concern over electronic friends versus real life friends was quickly dispelled when studies found that most social network users were connected to people that they knew in real life, not just electronically. So there, it wasn't like you were just making electronic friends. You were connecting with people you would meet for dinner or you know, at family functions. But this solution led to another more important concern regarding the nature of relationships online as well as the intellectual content. Given the brief postings, the large friend groups, and the limited time of users, most comments are short, and many of those diverse postings may never be seen by viewers because they just get put at the end of the queue, which people don't usually have time to go through. So that's something that we have to sort of continue to think about. Concerning literal legal justice, one scholar notes that social networking may give rise to technological innovations that democratize legal information and offer low-cost low support to self-represented -re litigants. The author envisions a broad transformation of civil lit litigation. You can get free legal advice, accurate free legal advice through social networking. The use of the, democ of the word democracy is an interesting one, particularly when used in relation to the Steubenville case. Certainly, free speech is every American's right, but in this case, the freedom of speech, in large part due to social networking, led to old-fashioned vigilanteism on an international scale, an outcome of social networking that has not received much attention. A recent New Yorker article entitled Trial by Twitter examines the facts of the case in the light of social networking. Author Ariel Levy opened saying, one Saturday in August 2012, a 16-year-old girl in West Virginia did something that teenagers do, and we all did it, we know. She told her parents that she was sleeping over at another girl's house across the Ohio River, and then after her mother dropped her off there, she and a few friends left that house and headed to another party. The story that most of us heard was that the girl was drunk beyond reason and was carried by football players from party to party, brutally raped by many, videotaped and twittered by even more, and even urinated on. What actually happened was awful, but it was not this sensational. Like many cases of this kind, the girl could not recall what happened. Witnesses were running scared. Others were showboating, using this, this event to show how macho they were. And in the end, only two boys were tried, adjudicated delinquent, the equivalent of a guilty verdict, which one, one was sentenced to a year in juvenile detention, and the other convicted of both rape and disseminating child pornography, and received two years and was ordered to register as a sex offender for 20 years. Was this justice? I'll let you be the judge. This is not the first time something like this has happened, but we can pray that it never happens again, but the outlook is not good. Levy, for instance, is quick to note our rape culture is not an empty term of ima or an imaginary phenomenon. According to the survey published by the Centers for Disease Control in 2001, one in five American women have been raped or ex experienced attempted rape. Worldwide, women between 15 and 44 are more, li more likely to be injured or die from male violence than from traffic accidents, cancer, malaria, and the effects of war combined. This sustained brutality would be impossible without a culture that enables it, a value system in which women are currency and sex is something that men get or take from them. I'm going to ask Cassie to pass out the handouts and on one side, you're going to see an ad by Dolce at Gabbana. They're notoriously brutal towards women. Another is a Budweiser ad where the woman looks like a bottle of beer. Women are currency, 
Women are objects, women are things. Female objectification is ubiquitous. Now, I know some of you are thinking that male objectification is also ubiquitous. But I want you to turn the paper over and see what men look like in the same position as women. Okay, this is our comic relief in this serious moment. Um, some comedians, John Stewart, uh, Stephen Colbert, and um, Steve Car Carroll, are you know in in the positions that women are generally photographed in. In another, in another, um, in the other picture, it's the men from The Hangover posing as the women pose on uh, Vanity Fair. But note too, I don't know if you can see this, the women are literally naked where the men have uh, body stockings on. Okay. It's not the same. Consequently, when some of the young men talked about the case on their phone and during videos, it was clear that they and their college, colleagues viewed the young women as nothing more, and I love this phrase, and I came up with it myself, nothing more than a tourist attraction on the highway of adolescent sexuality. This is what they said, you don't need any foreplay with a dead girl. She's deader than O.J.'s wife. These are young men, middle class men, saying these things online. You know, they're showboating here. Unfortunately, these sentiments have been around a long time and we must continue to work against them. But what makes this case more complicated is the use of social media. As Levy notes, and we may all remember, for good or ill, Fifteen years ago, the football players would have escaped suspicion before smartphones and Twitter rumors floated around high schools and, sorry, rumors floated, floated around high schools and then dissipated, often before adults knew what was real and what was an adolescent imagination or gossip. Now, however, the parents and the criminal justice system relied on images posted to social media to create a case against these young men. So it would seem that social media helped promote justice, but as many of you know, this was not the case. In addition to high school students, parents and police, however, a blogger who lived at one time in Steubenville and really had a grudge against the town, discovered the story and helped it go viral, posting comments on the sexist nature of the town and alleged rapes over the years, sexual misconduct, etc., completely unsupported, you know, just posting rumors. In a matter of weeks, the story had spun out of control. The girl's name, generally withheld in newspapers, was accidentally released, and the Steubenville football team, in fact, the entire town, was characterized as, for lack of a better phrase, rape central. John Zittren, a professor of law and computer science at Harvard, says that people seeking justice online fall into two distinct groups. There are those who think they're the bloodhound gang and want to solve the case. And there are those who believe that people aren't taking things seriously, either because of corruption or because in the eyes of the vigilante, they have a bias. Vigilanteism, yellow journalism, and bias are unfortunately part of the human condition as well. And we try to have safeguards in place to assure that these do not overwhelm justice. But the internet and social media in particular have very few breaks. Once the train leaves the station, the train leaves the station. Levy notes, the internet is uniquely qualified as a venue for public shaming. It's a town square big enough to put all the world's sinners in stocks. And in some cases, even those who are not sinners. In this way, social media becomes gossip on steroids. Social media is not evil or bad, and it's certainly here to stay, but given the speed with which information can be disseminated, all must use restraint. We also must be clear that an online relationship is different than a face-to-face -face relationship. Duh, you're thinking. But one of the football players thought that what happened to the young woman was in fact kind of okay because she had been having an online relationship with one of the football players. 
Their text constituted a relationship that afforded the young man certain sexual privileges. In other words, she was asking for it, but this, in this case, electronically. So was justice done in the Steubenville case? In terms of the criminal justice system, to a certain extent, yes. And without the social networking component, the case might never have come to trial. But the fact that groups of people recorded the event, used the event for their own self-aggrandizement, and did nothing to intervene is still troubling. In this case, at least the social networking served to transform a young woman into an object, something to be passed around, if not among the men, then definitely among the social networking uh, users, both those who wanted to help her and those who didn't want to help her. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops recognizes the power of the technology and suggests that it is a powerful tool to use to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the Steubenville case illustrates, we have a good deal of work to, re that, to reach that goal. Just last weekend, for example, a woman was taped with a man near o OU's campus. Whether she was sober enough to consent is at issue, but the recording of the sexual activities and the subsequent dissemination indicates sadly that Steubenville is not the exception to the rule. Thank you. That was a nice blend of the social and the, uh, and the um, modern communications. And now uh, we're going to hear from Jonathan um, with his taxes and finances and the like. Thank you. Do you want this, Jonathan? Okay. Okay, so I have entitled my presentation, God's Calling for Everyone. Um, and, you know, I've been invited to kind of talk from the perspective of, you know, people that are, um, you know, I'm studying accounting and finance. There's a lot of people here that are, um, you know, studying business and things like that. Um, you know, what does it mean? Um, what type of God calling does God have for everybody, basically? I don't think that God just calls certain people, but that he calls everybody. So, if I can get this to work. Well. Do you want me to press it? Oh, I'll be happy to be. Well. It's got a long switch on the side of it. On the side of it? It's on. Maybe it doesn't have batteries. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to start off with the uh, talking about the idea of God's calling as a form of God's grace, and. Um, you know, we, we all kind of hear of the idea of God's grace as his forgiveness. You know, that we have all, um, we've all sinned, we've all done things that are wrong. And so we ask God for his forgiveness and he forgives us freely. And that's great. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, but what I want to talk about is, is deeper than that, that God's grace is more than just forgiveness. Uh, it includes a number of other things. Um, God gives us a number of gifts. Um, 
you know, there's the, uh, or is it making noises there? Or? Okay. Um, God gives us a number of gifts. Um, one of those is um, that he calls us to, um, you know, to meaningful work. Uh, he calls us to participate um, in our society and to, to do positive things and to help other people. Um, and that's kind of what um, I want to talk about today. You know, God will work through us to help others. Um, and also that, um, you know, God has a specific calling, I think, and that we can experience joy and meaning in our lives. We're not just like forgiven for our sins, like, oh boy, you know, I did a bunch of terrible things and now I'm pardoned and that's it. But it's that God actually calls us to a life of joy and meaning beyond that. Um, and like I said, he calls us to meaningful work. So it's important to note that God doesn't necessarily need our talents. Obviously, God can do whatever he chooses to do. He's powerful. He created the universe and everything. But God chooses as, as a matter of his grace to work through us. You know, he doesn't have to, but he decides, hey, you know, I, I am going to work through you to maybe help somebody else, to bless somebody else's life. And, of course, we need God's help to pursue the calling that he has for us. Um, you know, that's one of the awesome things about the way that God calls us is he also gives us the means to accomplish the things that he's called us to. And we also need God's forgiveness when we mess up. I mean, everybody here has made mistakes, um, whether it's, you know, sin in our personal life or, um, you know, maybe we, we can make mistakes at, at our work and our family life. Um, and one of the great things about God's grace is that he continually forgives us for those things. So the, the question that I want to ask is, who does God work through? Now, we know um, that God works through those that are called to full-time ministry. Um, we need pastors, teachers, leaders in the church. Um, we know that we know certainly that God calls people to those roles. So nothing that I'm saying today is meant to denigrate, um, you know, the work of, of people that are called to full-time ministry. Um, we need people that devote more time and energy to understanding and communicating the truth. You know, don't we need people that maybe go to seminary for a few years and can really understand um, spirituality in a, in a much more deep and thorough way so that they can present that? Um, don't we need people to devote themselves to ministry full-time? I think so. Um, and in uh, Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, it says, uh, so Christ gave him, uh, excuse me, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. But what about the rest of us? <laughs> now, what's interesting that you, you may note there, on reading it initially, you may not notice this, but... Um, the role that the people that are called to full-time ministry, part of their role is to equip the other people, the lay people, uh, to do these works. So it's not just that the people that are called to the full-time ministry are to do all the work and then everyone else just kind of sits there and does nothing, but that actually they are, to ha are serving us by helping us to be prepared for the work that we have to do. So the question becomes, what if I'm not called, which is a lot of people. <laughs> Um, it's very interesting to note um, that a lot of biblical figures had secular professions. You know, we kind of have this idea that, um, or I guess kind of this idea is presented a lot in, in modern culture that um, the really spiritual people are the people that are in, um, that pursue this full time, and then everybody else is kind of in a, a second class citizen in some way. Um, sometimes that, that idea is presented. But when we actually read through the scripture, we don't see that. We see something very different. Um, we see that Joseph was actually an accountant and a manager. Um, he was put in charge of um, collecting grain and taxes and all sorts of things for Pharaoh. We see that Moses was a shepherd. Um, before he was ever called to, uh, to his later role, he worked as a shepherd and was very successful at that. Um, David, uh, who wrote a number of the Psalms, um, was also a shepherd, a successful one, and he was a king, which was a politician. <laughs> so if you think about it, um, a very important figure in biblical history was actually a political figure. You know, he was, was in charge of the day-to-day -day, um, administration of the government. 
And then Jesus, of course, was a carpenter. And sometimes we gloss over this because it's not, it's not um, a point of emphasis in the Gospels, but it's very important to note, um, you know, just historically, it, it seems that um, probably when his uh, father Joseph passed away, that Jesus came in, took over the family business, and worked very hard. It's likely that he was supporting his family, um, and he did a very good job of that. He was considered a well-respected member of the community. What I think is really interesting is that the apostles also came from the marketplace. Um, they were fishermen, you know, there was a tax collector in there. There were people that had secular professions. And it's not that there weren't people available. Uh, there were, you know, there was a class of priests, there were um, teachers of the law, there were Pharisees, there were all these different people that had um, committed themselves full time to studying the Old Testament law. But Jesus selects people from the marketplace. It's, it's very interesting that he does that. And then Paul also, um, in his ministry, he worked as a tent maker. And he didn't just merely support himself through that, but we actually have some record that um, a number of people that came into the faith were people that he had formed business associations with. Um, there were also a number of wealthy people in the early church that uh, they would host church meetings in their homes. So you had people with, that were very successful business people, and they were the ones that provided uh, the space for the church to meet. And the laity has a unique calling. Um, so I'm going to read this quote. This is from the, uh, the Second Vatican Council. It says, But the laity, by their very vocation, seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and by ordering them according to the plan of God. Therefore, since they are tightly bound up in all types of temporal affairs, it is their special task to order to throw light on these affairs in such a way that they may come into being and then continually increase according to Christ to the praise of the Creator and the Redeemer. So what is this calling that the laity has? We have a unique position within society. Uh, we are called to be God's light in our profession. So whatever profession it is that you are in, you are unique, you're in a unique position to be God's light in that, to do good in that. We are called to be God's light to our families. So we can, um, in our family life, we can love our children, we can raise them and discipline them, we can love our spouses. Um, I mean, how many, uh, how many people can you think of that have a very positive view of God and understand that God loves me because of the way that my parents loved me? Now, not everybody, I know that not, that not all parents are, are, are perfect, but that is a role that God calls a lot of people to. We have unique skills. Um, we can volunteer our unique talents to glorify God. Uh, for example, um, accountants can provide uh, free tax preparation services to the needy. I know uh, Professor Gilmore, uh, Professor Osborne, and a lot of the uh, students here work really hard on helping people with a very practical need. And it's something that not everybody can do. Not everybody can do a tax return. Um, but we have people that have that ability and we are in a unique position to be able to give that service to people. There are people that are medical specialists that can provide um, special assistance to those that are in need. People that um, have, you know, that are doctors, nurses, dentists can provide, you know, free clinics. There are people that go overseas to do medical missions. You know, they help people with dental problems and things like that in places where there's no, um, there's inadequate medical services. And then we have people that are, you know, attorneys, financial advisors, others that can, can provide counsel that includes spiritual guidance. And it's not just, I mean, we all know that there's a lot of scumbag lawyers out there. You know, we've all seen there are accountants that, you know, cook the books, we've heard all the stories. But don't we also need people that are out there in those professions that are doing the right things? And more than that, that can give people really good practical advice on those matters. Um, you know, more than just the, the general theology or pastoral counseling that I think the professional ministry can give, that maybe somebody can bring a spiritual perspective uh, to being a financial advisor and ask someone questions like, well, how much money do you need to spend on your house? You know, do you really need to drive a new, uh, a brand new Lincoln every two years and ask those types of practical down-to-earth questions. 
And we are also uniquely called to provide for financial needs. Those that are in full-time ministry um, you know, rely on the people that are out in the marketplace earning a living. I want to bring up um, a couple of principles that I think are really important that really help those of us that are called to be in the marketplace. Um, the first one is the Sabbath principle. And in the, uh, in the Old Testament, um, there was this commandment that we were supposed to take one day off from work every week. Now, why was that? One reason was that we would have time for spiritual things. Um, another reason was to have time for, to spend with our family. You know, if you're working seven days a week, sun up to sun down, it's very difficult to spend time with family. Um, it also illustrates the, the spiritual principle that life is not just about money, but that there are other things in life that are important. Now, what does it mean for us today? Obviously, that was written over 3,000 years ago. <laughs> We're in a very different society with different professions. But how does that principle of the Sabbath apply to us today? I think the point stands that money alone is not going to make us happy. That's just as true for ancient people as it is for us. We still need time for spiritual things. We still need time to attend church, to pray, to meditate, um, to... You know, maybe to read the Bible or to read uh, books that bring a spiritual enlightenment. We still need time for our families. There's a lot of people in professional careers that this is a real pressure. That, um, you know, getting enough time away from work uh, to be able to spend time with family. Another important uh, principle that I think is uh, really for us that are called to the, the marketplace is financial generosity. In the Old Testament, there's a commandment to give 10%. It's called the tithe, oftentimes. Um, one of the reasons for this was to show that God will provide for our needs. So it's the idea that um, I have enough because God has given me these things. And if you read the context for, for several of these commands, that's what he said. You know, he says, I'm the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I'm going to provide for you. And because of that, you don't have to worry that there isn't going to be enough for me that I can give generously and there will still be enough for me. We can also help provide for the poor. This is a very practical way that God provides for, uh, for people that need uh, financial assistance. And it goes back to that principle that money alone does not meet our needs. It's being happy is not about accumulating enough stuff for me. There's also a component of giving something to other people. What does this mean for us today? I think a really important principle to remember is that generosity will starve greed. I think that if we sit down and we think about, uh, when we sit down to think about what can I give, we start to think about, well, what am I living on? What am I keeping for myself? How am I being selfish? And when we start to think about what can I give, you know, it starts to help us to reprioritize things. Another reason is that, frankly, we are the richest people ever to walk this planet. I mean, there is so much financial wealth in America today compared to, you look at people in biblical times or even people in other countries. I think it's probable that God is calling a lot of people in this nation to, to voluntarily live at a, at a lower standard, not at a poverty level, but to live at a lower standard so that we can really do something about a lot of these social issues that the other presenters have been talking about that there are people that are starving in this country, there are um, people that are starving all around the world, there are diseases that can be cured, and we can do something about it. I think that it also means that for us, we should give of our money, but not only our money, but also our time and our skills. Um, one of the temptations that we may have, especially if we make a lot of money, is to throw money at the problem. Well, you know, I made, $500,000 last year, I gave 200,000 of it away, so that's it, that's all I have to do. But I think that we need to sit down and think about, well, you know, if I have the, <laughs> this ability that I can earn this kind of money, how can I serve somebody with that ability? Maybe I can volunteer um, in some way to help people in the community. So I think it's not just financial giving, but it's really uh, giving of those time, that time and those abilities that we have. And I think that we should also give until it hurts. I think that a lot of us may end up in a position of, like I said, we're very wealthy. And for some of us, I think 10% is a good number. But I think if someone's making several hundred thousand dollars a year or several million dollars a year, maybe we should choose to give more than 10% and to choose to really live a lower lifestyle 
to give generously to help other people. And I think that both of these principles bring up um, their, their guidance for us. There's a, a positive guidance, but I think it's also a warning to us. In order to pursue wealth and power, a lot of people bring harm upon themselves. I'm sure we've all seen it. We all know those people. You know, there's a lot of people that just spend inordinate amounts of time at work. You know, working from six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Um, it can really be a form of, um, I mean, it can cause all sorts of problems. Um, you've got neglect of family. If you're at work all of the time, consistently, how can you be there for your family? It also brings an inability to participate in spiritual community if you're working seven days a week. I mean, literally, how do you have time to go to church? How do you have time to participate in meaningful spiritual community? You also don't have time to volunteer. You know, you, there literally aren't enough hours in the day, and you may be so exhausted from working that many hours that you don't have the ability to give your time and your skills back to the community. Another, I think, really scary thing is that possessions can really take over our lives, and we don't realize it. You know, we see people getting into debt slavery. Remember the financial crisis back in 2008? What brought that on? Well, you had a bunch of people that were buying houses they couldn't afford, and they were borrowing, borrowing money that they couldn't pay back. And what happened? I mean, you had people that lost everything. You had, um, really, our fin financial system almost collapsed as a result of it. And yet, we still see people that are living beyond their means. They're buying things on credit cards. They're buying cars they can't afford. Um, this pursuit of possessions can really lead us to debt slavery, and it's dangerous. And there's also, there also can be a really inordinate amount of time and effort spent on upkeep of our possessions and acquisition of possessions. So we spend all of our time at the mall. We spend all of our time thinking about the new car that we want to buy. We spend uh, a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, how does our house stack up to everybody else in the neighborhood? What do we need to do to get ahead of everyone else? Here's a good quote. Uh, the things you own end up owning you. That's from, uh, from Fight Club. So lastly, I want to talk about, uh, you know, if money isn't going to make us, if money on its own isn't going to make us happy, what is? And I think it really is this spiritual dimension of joy. In Philippians uh, 4, 12 to 13, it says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So, you know, this is Paul speaking, and he was someone who had been thrown in jail. He was also someone who had probably had some financial wealth at some point. Um, you know, he had had success at various points in his life, and he had had great failures. And his point here is that our happiness doesn't just come from our, our uh, possessions, our accomplishments, our circumstances, but that there really is a spiritual dimension to it. And we need to, we need to tend to our spiritual lives uh, not just our careers or our things. And really that our spiritual life enables us to enjoy these other aspects of our life. When our spiritual life is right, I think that we really can, I'm, I'm not speaking in any way as being against possessions, against the free market, against capitalism, you know, <laughs> hard work, any of those things. I'm not opposed to those things. Um, I think we can even enjoy these possessions that we have, this great material wealth that we have, if we're properly grounded with that, uh, with that spiritual center.